Hi everybody, very welcome to Mentor and yet another video podcast. As always, I hope you're doing absolutely fantastic. On the video today, guys, I'm going to talk about the difference between flying passengers and flying cargo, especially during the ongoing crisis. But then I realized, hmm, maybe I'm not the best person to talk about this, given that I haven't flown cargo myself. So what we'll do instead is we'll head over to Kelsey from 74th Gear and let's see what he has to say about it. Stay tuned. Kelsey, how are things? I'm good, I'm good. How are you doing, Peter? Oh, well, you know, sitting here 26 days into the quarantine, but I'm doing, <laughs> I'm doing great. Uh, where are you? Uh, right now I'm in LA, as you can see. I'm, I'm about to go to work. Uh, I got a quick flight going up to Anchorage, Alaska here in a few hours. So. Ah, cool. How long is that flight? I want to say it's about five and a half hours. I haven't I haven't looked at the release yet. I wanted to do this, and then I'm going to look at all the paperwork before I head out to the plane. Sounds sounds reasonable. Um, listen, yeah. so we well, I wanted to do a video here, really trying to explain to people um, what, if any, differences there are between cargo pilots and passenger pilots. So, first of all, the question I want to ask you: Did you need to take any special license in order to fly cargo? Uh, no, it, you know, is it would be, you know, there's 737s that are cargo only. So it's what's behind you is there's really no difference. So there, there's no different type rating or anything that, like that you have to do. It's just, and, and honestly, I'm sure you know this when you're flying, even when you have a plane full of people, people would ask me sometimes, are you nervous right before landing? And, and you kind of forget about everything there, right? The door is there. You're kind of just closed off and focused on what you're doing and you don't really feel Oh my gosh! There's all these people here who are judging me. At least, at least I don't. No. So when I'm flying passengers or when I'm flying cargo, that is really no difference. Really, one of the main differences is just trying to make some of the, uh, you know, climbing or descending a little bit smoother if I have passengers on board. Really? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Because otherwise. Like, like, I fully agree with you. Um, I, I never think about the fact that I have passengers behind me when I'm flying. I, I try to do, you know, the time, the, the same type of flying that I do all the time. I always try to do nice landings. I always try to do safe, um, kind of turn around things like that. So for right. me, um, for me, it's absolutely no, and that, no difference. But the real point I wanted to make here, obviously, is that no. The licenses are the same. You get your right. your CPL multi-engine instrument rating, your MCC course, and once you have that, you can start applying for jobs. But um, but let's have a look at the, some of the differences then. So I, for example, I will have a 25-minute turnaround. So that means that I will turn up the gate, and then I will get all of the passengers off. We will be cleaning the cabin. We'll be refueling. We'll be getting the passengers on, and then we'll go. How does a turnaround look for you? <laughs> um, <laughs> For the most part, we don't do, usually it's just one leg and done, generally. It's one leg for me and I'm done. Uh, but when we do have to do two legs, um, if they're doing what they call download and upload, so if they got to do a full download, so take everything off of our plane, uh, our main deck and our bellies and re-upload, depending on the base that we're at in the world, it can be two to three hours. <laughs> So, you should say at this point as well for those who doesn't know about your excellent YouTube channel that that Kelsey flies the uh, the seven four seven and specifically the Dreamlifter. So yeah, so so I do. So there's two different types of, you know, when you're doing the Dreamlifter, there's no. Well, I guess there are turns that we do. There's a couple of legs that we do where it's they we land, and even then it's same. It's like two to three hours, but. Um, it's not a lot of freight that's going in and out, obviously, but on your typical, any other airport that we go to, there's a lot of pallets that have to come off. So it can be two to three hours. And that is honestly more tiring than anything. Cause you're just, you know, it's kind of like if you, if you have a two or three hour sit at the airport and you're just sitting there waiting for your next flight, yeah. you'd rather have 25 minutes where you're running and doing everything. Cause your mind active, that three hour sitting is it's difficult. It's it's true. I, I actually when I was when I was training to 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 become a pilot, I I managed to score a jump seat on a mail flight during the night on a short three sixty back in northern Sweden, 
And, wow. Yeah. And I, I remember, you know, <laughs> flying out of Sundsvall, where, where I'm from, uh, flying down to Orlando. And then the guys just kind of, you know, they left the aircraft there. They went into this little cafeteria and then they just sat around. And we're talking like at two o'clock at night, local time. They sat right. until four or five, just drinking coffee. The same kind of dudes turning up all, all the days, obviously. And then they would just hook up with the aircraft again and, and fly back with the mail that was going on the return flight. And right. I didn't remember that those four hours were excruciating, just sitting yeah. there waiting. It's painful. Um, when I did only PAX flight, it was the same. When I'd have a three-hour sit in the terminal, it just like it felt like forever. So yeah, now I mean, luckily on the seven four we have bunks. So sometimes you'll go into the bunks, but there's people coming up and down the steps, and they're bringing catering on, and they need you to sign stuff, and they're banging around. On, so it's not like you really can get a rest, but. Um, yeah, oh. so two to three hours would probably be the average of what it takes if you do do more than one leg. All right, all right, that's cool. So um, talking about the loading and things, um, are you guys involved in loading at any stage? Like, do you supervise it, or is that all done by Loadmaster? So the Loadmaster is in control of everything. So what will happen is everything that's below, like there's the main deck, which is where passengers would be on a normal a normal 747 passenger bird, there's that main deck. And we go and inspect that with a sheet, which basically says this pallet is going into this spot. And if there's anything that's um, high risk, things that you wouldn't put on a, on a passenger aircraft that we may be taking, you know, there's certain things that can't sit next to each other for fire risks. So we'll get a sheet and we'll check everything against that and verify that everything's in the spot that it's supposed to be. And then we'll go walk the deck and, uh, we call it walking the deck. You basically just go in and check that all the cargo is loaded where it's supposed to be, and then it's all secured down so you don't have a cargo shift. Um, for obvious reasons, that would be a problem. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We all, I think we all remember that, that horrible footage from the 747 that had the cargo shift in Afghanistan. I think it was yeah. military material that shifted, and like there was absolutely nothing those guys could do. So Yeah, the MRAPs, they moved, and yeah, so... That's, yeah. you know, that is something I actually, I just posted a photo uh, a couple of days ago uh, when I was walking the deck on Instagram and I mentioned, I mentioned, you know, how important it is to go and do that. So I always go and it's very important that you, you know, that's one of those things that the whole crew is relying on. You might have a crew for a load master and a mechanic that are all flying with you. And, you know, the load master is obviously responsible for it to make sure that it's done. But like, like everything in a two pilot cockpit or a flight deck, you have you know, you're a captain or a first officer and you're checking to make sure the other guy's not missing something. And so I'll go and I'll walk and you got to pay attention because the rest of the crew are depending on you to make sure that it's where it's supposed yeah, to be. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so do you, like during flight, is there a way for you to access the cargo hold to go and check if, you know, during the flight to make sure that everything looks all right? So on the main deck, um, on the main deck of a typical 747, there's no reason to ever go down there. So the only time is, is if we're transporting live cargo. Uh, so sometimes we'll be transporting horses or animals. Hmm. And in that scenario, we have handlers and those handlers are responsible for doing that. And they'll come up and let us know, Hey, we're going to go check on it. And then we have um, oxygen masks and things for them to take down there with them in case we get into a depressurization situation that they're not stuck without a mask. So they got portable, O2 mask to take and go inspect, uh, you know, check on the horses or whatever yeah. while the while they're yeah. See, that that's interesting stuff because that's the things that that we, you know, just flying passengers wouldn't think about because obviously we yeah. have we have four um, masks on each uh, on each set of rows, um, which means that there's always going to even in the toilets there are masks falling down. So if we have a depressurization, that's all catered for. But of course, that's not the case if you're flying cargo. So that that's a great point. So yeah, on the upper deck we have the mask, and then obviously, or, or the you know obviously on the flight deck we got the the mask there. But on the obviously in the cargo on the belly there is none. And, so. and for the horses, big masks. Yeah, big big mask for the horses. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. Cool. So from from one you know one definite um, difference that we can see right now is that obviously I am here in my t-shirt, you are there in your uniform, which means you are flying, I am not. So that was be a, right. at the moment a huge difference between being a cargo pilot and being a passenger pilot are you seeing for sure more, are you seeing more work right now than usual yeah and uh a, a lot more um and that's you know because 
the you know a lot of the airlines are used to you moving freight in their bellies you know when they're doing long flights they're moving freight in their bellies and obviously if they're not flying they're not moving that freight and because they're not moving that freight someone's got to move it and so it's going to the companies that move freight and that is obviously increasing the demand a lot and and I'm actually starting to see some of the airlines here in the U.S. at least that are flying planes without any passengers with just belly freight um, because the freight prices have gone up so much because the demand has come so high. Yeah, so uh, it was I, I did a video um, a, a few weeks back about that what aircraft were actually flying still, and I mentioned that as a as a reason that you know the, the cargo flights are still there. And in, in, in fairness, in the beginning now, before we see an, a proper economical downturn, we'll probably see more freight. And even passenger aircraft flying only for freight in order to kind of recoup a little bit of their income and keep their, you know, their aircraft flying and their crews up and running. Um, sure. Yeah. So, so that's that's really interesting. Um, what do you prefer then? I mean, have you have you flown passenger like pure passenger flights? Yeah, I've flown pure pure passengers on the seven four. Uh, so we have a, a few a few passenger only seven fours. And then I've flown, obviously, a few passenger or only passengers and different jobs that I've had. So um, I've done an only passenger job. I've done a, I've done an only cargo job, and and a, a mixture of both. So. Okay. What do you prefer? I, I I like having the mixture, honestly, because the the nice thing about when you're doing cargo is is you get there, you get up to cruise, and then you put on like a hoodie, and you know if you're on a long flight, you'll put on like pajamas, basically. Because it's 12 hours and you're just hanging out in casual clothes. You don't have to ask for permission to go in and out of the flight deck. Um, there's just a curtain there. So you want to go out and go to the bathroom or go get a snack or go get some food or stretch your legs. You can do that without asking for permission. And that's really cool. Um, and then, you know, when you do the when you do flights with, with people and you got, you know, 17, 18, 20 flight attendants, you know, and 400 something people, then that's fun as well because you get to a layover and you have a huge group of people and you know three or four are going to want to do what you want to do so you're able to have a group of people to go out and do things with when you're on your layover so i, I like the mix and i think i i would get bored if i was only doing one always all the time um yeah. but uh, so, yeah, yeah. No, there's it's a good it's a great point it's kind of what i'm saying with with being a, a simulator instructor that you know it's, it's great to have a mix of different things because you get to appreciate the differences in both but I, before we go any further, I want you all to try to picture now Kelsey flying a 747 in his pajamas. I, I, think, <laughs> I, think, I think that's very important that we all do take that mental picture and, and savor it. <laughs> I've, I've thought of, I, I, I think I got a photo, I have a photo somewhere and I've done a few on like my Instagram stories where I'm just sitting in the back in the bunk or talking or making a quick video. Uh, I just have like, well, right now what I have in my bag is just a blue hoodie, which I've been flying with for probably too long i probably need to get a new hoodie that i always fly with but i fly with the same hoodie and i fly with the hoodie for two reasons one a lot of times that upper deck gets cold um i like so i like to put it over my head and then i, I sometimes i'll fly with it on my head just to keep the sun from because sometimes you're flying with the sun for 10 11 12 hours so you have the sun banging on your neck and so just for I, I should probably wear sunscreen, but I just use the the hoodie. I put the hoodie up over my head, and people make jokes and call me a gangster, but I don't, I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you do. You do have that gangster vibe around you. Really. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, it's it's all, my gangster vibe. All of us, all of us uh, gingers, we have that bit of a gangster vibe as we walk the streets. I, exactly. I, I am, exactly. I'm aware of how people are kind of moving away, and I think it is probably because of the gangster vibe. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, um, what do you like? What do you like most? Um, do you like flying the, the normal seven four seven or the Dreamlifter? And is there any differences in between the two? Yeah, there's some differences of, of how it handles. Um, and but to me, it's very similar. And I've talked to some guys who say, "Oh no, it's it's a lot lighter on the controls." Or it's, to me, it feels so similar. So maybe they're just better pilots than me, and they're able to notice the nuances. Uh, I flew it for over a year, and uh, for me, it's it's very similar. It, it rumbles more. It, it's obviously not as aerodynamic smooth uh, as, you know, your normal 7.4. Mm. But, you know, it's essentially an old 7.4 where they just ripped out the middle and then built the the shell to, yeah. for, for, for it. So it, you, it is – it's definitely different. It's unique. I, I really – honestly, it's – you know, there's four in the world, and it's an honor to know, hey, I flew this thing, and I'm, 
I'm thinking when I'm like an old man, uh, 80, sitting at the bar talking about I used to fly the Dreamlift, where people are going to be like, listen to this guy, old man telling stories, and this they think I'm, you know, totally lying. But that's, what man, that's what it's all about. It's about having the coolest stories when you're an old dude sitting by the bar. That's that. That's that's exactly. what we're all working towards, you know. Exactly. Um, what else would I think? Yeah, you guys, I guess now, um, I, I know you did a video of when you reacted to, to um, your president, Donald Trump, as you were talking about the dream lifter. And you talk, you said that, that you're doing a bit of transporting of medical equipment at the moment. Yeah. So um, something really cool that Boeing did is because they've slowed down their production line, the for obvious reasons, you know, Seattle is one of the hotspots here in the U.S. So they slowed down the production. And as a result of that, they're using the Dream Lifter to transport, you know, medical supplies because obviously it's got the range uh, and the capability. So they're able to put that, uh, you know, you know, use that plane for something good. Uh, and so they, we got four. They, I believe, they gave three to the to the U.S. government to move whatever supplies they need to do, which I thought was pretty cool. Yeah, no, no, that's great. And it's it's lovely to see big corporations take on that kind of responsibility because I, I think that's what's going to need now now more than ever. And do you have you have you gone to China to pick up any of these goods or have it been mostly within the US? Um so I haven't flown the Dreamlifter on one of those medical missions yet because that just happened a couple of days ago. Hmm. Uh, so I haven't picked up one of those planes yet. So I don't really even know where they're running to or what they're going to pick up. And I don't know. I guess we'll see if I get one of those flights or not. So um, I don't know where, where they're going to pick up all those supplies. I've been moving those. I've been moving medical supplies just on our normal freighters. Hmm. I haven't done one on the Dreamlifter since that announcement, I think, what, five or six days ago. Have you done any, um, like, because you guys are flying and you're sometimes flying into these hotspots and even into countries where there is now um like a no-go zone where people are not letting other um, nationalities in are there special procedures for you guys when you fly into the likes of south korea or china or somewhere where they've closed the borders yeah so even where there's places where there's no go where you know you can't go as a passenger they're still letting us go uh, so they, it's like a like a cargo cutout because obviously they might have closed the borders but they still need the freight to come in it's been honestly a challenging thing for us and for the airlines because it's there's been times where you've taken off and 10 hours later during that 10 hours the rules have changed yeah. and the crew lands and they're like hey it's a new rule you're not allowed here and you're just like i just flew 10 hours well no we want your cargo we just don't want you you need to leave so it's been some of those really tricky situations so it's a it's an everly fast moving dynamic, which I'm glad I don't have to deal with that. And uh, so there's that. And then there's places where, you know, you're getting sprayed. Uh, something that's happening now in, in certain countries, they're requiring us to wear the mask when we when we get off or when we're moving around in public. Um, there are certain require some places aren't requiring it. Um, and then in China, especially at the peak, what was happening is they were having connection flights. So you'd go um Incheon to shanghai to anchorage and then you were just stopping they were loading or unloading or whatever they needed to do and then you'd continue on and they'd put a usually a heavy crew on there so four pilots and that way nobody was having to get off and you know move around inside china yeah, all right so have you uh, they, they haven't they haven't been spraying you guys have they with the disinfectant i, disinfect I haven't see? I have not been sprayed, but I, I know some guys who have been sprayed. Yeah, yeah. I know it's crazy times that we're living in at the moment. And I, yeah. I fully understand that. It, like what's happening here in Spain is, is horrendous. And what's happened in Italy as well. And what's happening in the United States right now. So I guess we're all going to just have to, like I've been saying on the channel for long now, comply with what the local regulations are. I have been in house arrest for 26 days now. And it looks like we're going to be here for another two weeks at least. And I'm, Yeah. We'll see when that happens to you guys. It, it's strange. I mean, I was just flying into in, into Amsterdam, I don't know, a week and a half ago, maybe. And that's a, that, I mean, it's a very busy airport. You know, it's, there's a lot going on. The airspace normally in Europe has a lot going on. And I think we were somewhere over England and they just said, do you want to just, you got this, you know, the routing in Europe is because the airspace is so tight. Yeah. You can, it's kind of indirect. Yeah. And I think we were some, yeah, exactly. And we were somewhere over, I, I want to say somewhere close to London. And they said, hey, uh, do you guys need to do that route or do you want something more direct? Said, yeah, we'll take more direct. And it was like 
London direct to the like initial port uh, fix on the approach in Amsterdam. Yeah. No, that okay. That yes. Yeah, it, and it's weird. You're coming in. Nobody's on the radio. You coming in and landing, and it's just like okay, go over here. You don't talk to anybody. You, it, it's just it's strange very very strange it's, yeah no i can imagine i mean i haven't been flying anything so I ha i've missed out on the whole quietness in the uh, airspace <laughs> but i can like you you can definitely tell that something is wrong when you are getting those kind of directs um i've heard yeah. stories about like the airspace over uh, i think over manchester was made into category g airspace like uncontrolled airspace because there's there was no right. flights nothing allowed around there so there's, yes. yeah, there's some weird things going on. And I just hope that we get, can get this under control and get back to business as soon as possible. Um, there, there were a few, there were a few uh, ATC centers in the U.S. that the center broke. There was a couple of people that got corona in there. And they shut down that center and they shut down the airspace around it. I think one was near Indiana. Hmm. And they just had to vector all the planes around that airspace because they didn't have ATC coverage because there was nobody. It's, that's nuts, right? That's yeah, crazy. Yeah. So. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, I just want you to take care of yourself. Stay safe out there, Kelsey. Um, I hope to have sure. you back on the channel as soon as possible. Hopefully, we can meet up again like we did last time that we spoke. That was great. Yeah. Yeah, when Spain is better, th then I'll come over. <laughs> yeah, and then likewise to the US. So, <laughs> yeah. um, but thank you for your time. Um, fly safely up to Anchorage, and uh, I'll, talk to you, um, I'll talk to you next time, all right? Good. Sounds good. Thanks for having me. I'll talk to you soon. Take care, man. Bye-bye. Right, guys. Uh, thank you very much for that, Kelsey. That was really, really nice. It's always nice to check uh, to talk to Kelsey. I hope that you've checked out his YouTube channel, 74 Gear. He makes a lot of great aviation content, um, and among which something I really love is his Hollywood versus Reality series, which is really, really hilarious. So after you've checked this, go over and check out his channel. Subscribe to him as well. And I hope that I have earned a subscription as well. So click the bell and um, see you in my next video. Bye-bye. Right, guys, I really hope that you liked that. If you want more content like that, more aviation content, well then, check this out. Uh, I hope that you have subscribed to the channel and that you've highlighted the little notification bell. See you inside of the Mentor Aviation app and have an absolutely fantastic day. Bye-bye.